everyone. My name is Sonia Ferns. Uh, I'm from Perth, Western Australia. Uh, and I'm here today to speak to Geraldine O'Neill about her uh, National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning Research Fellowships, uh, which I'm honoured to um, share the findings with everybody um, that Geraldine's got to tell us about. I've got over 14 years experience in higher education in Australia and I'm an active researcher in teaching and learning around quality with a special focus on work integrated learning and industry engagement which is about authentic learning experiences for our students. Um, the ultimate aim of the fellowships is to improve the quality of higher education and inform policy and practice in Ireland's higher education sector. So with that, Geraldine, welcome. Thank you very much, Sonia. Nice to be here. So Ger just to start, Geraldine, would you like to give us a broad overview of what your research is about? Sure, yeah, no, delighted to. Um, so it's about assessing work integrated learning. Um, work integrated learning is a term I think that, that many people struggle with um, because maybe not a term that's used very much in the Irish sector, but it, it includes all the sort of work based placement type stuff that happens off campus, but also looks at um, activities that happen on campus and, and, and in, in the curriculum. So just on that term, so work, assessing work integrated learning, that spectrum of, of assessing those contexts. Um, particularly looking at assessing assessment and feedback, um, because feedback being a part of the assessment. Um, so I really wanted to explore this um, quite complex area of assessing work integrated learning. Um, initially, what I did was uh, through a series of webinars with the sector, we asked people what were the challenges in this area. And interestingly, what came up was authenticity, which is like meaningful assessments. Um, but also what came through was, well, it's okay to be authentic and it's great it's authentic, but it also needs to be consistent, you know, consistent across placements, consistent across different assessors. So this was coming through. So therefore I decided to look at developing, um, exploring this um, consistency and authenticity in work integrated learning. So I, what I did was, that I, I can go through the methodology a little bit more, but, but very quickly I did, you know, look at surveys, I did some workshops, um, and I interviewed some researchers um, to develop an understanding of this. And one of the key aims was that I would come up at the end of this research with some, some, some solutions to some of these challenges. So really I wanted to interrogate, yeah, some solutions to these challenges. So just if you, when you think of the term authenticity in terms of assessment, can you just give us some of the key themes that have come out around the challenges for people to both design and implement authentic assessment in a work integrated learning context? Yeah, it's interesting because when, when people thought, talk about authentic, uh, one of the things that comes through a lot is this idea of real life, real world, you know, very controversial term. Some people don't like it, um, but students use it a lot. But, the, but it's the idea that it's meaningful and, and linked with maybe the student's identity, who they think they are, but also who they, where they think they will be in the future. So whether it's, you know, a researcher or whether it's a particular discipline. So that idea of real world and, and, and that is a term that's often used with it. But actually it has a broader kind of connotation as well, because when you look at the sort of literature around it, it talks about things like, well, also around student empowerment and then being able to self-monitor and, and do other things. So that's another aspect of it. So it's quite a broad term and I'll, and I'll get into the findings a little bit later because it's not always, it doesn't always mean the same to everybody, uh, sure. but, but they're the kind of th key things when you're talking about authenticity, this idea of meaningful, valuable, you, often to the student, but it can be to others as well. Um, and interestingly, as I'm talking about it, sometimes this can be in tension with the idea of consistency. Um, because it actually, because it's meaningful to the person and it's meaningful and valuable to them and it empowers them, sometimes them being consistent across context and things can be, can be a bit challenging. So, so that's my sort of working definition of authentic, a term sort of, um, yeah, that, that, that is to say meaningful in real life is probably the most common understanding, but when you delve, delve deeper, it has other, other kind of understandings as well. Interesting, look forward to a, um, a more 
fulsome conversation at some yeah. date time. Um, tell us why you chose this topic. What interests you about this topic in particular and with a focus on ass assessment and authenticity? Well, I, I was involved in a national project around assessment and feedback for, for a year or two. I actually worked with the National Forum for a year or two and I was involved in a national project around developing assessment and the understanding of assessment, what it meant. Um, but as part of that project and, and my ongoing work in University College Dublin, um, assessment and feedback have been, I suppose, my, uh, my, my sort of, I don't know, the theme or the, my, my key, I suppose, uh, topic area. So my mom was interested in assessment it's so complex it's so challenging uh, but it's really really interesting and I do think that if you can crack assessment or enhance it in some ways you can go a long way to enhancing student learning and um, to getting the policies right so I was always interested assessment has always interested me from from lots of, lots of different angles um, I also think it's a really important thing in relation to you know students employability and that's why I suppose I'm very interested in this idea of, of employ employability it's kind can be seen like a dirty word in higher education sometimes that it's you know mm. that we there really for employability but students are really really um value it um a, a, mm. an interesting research study done by the national forum again on student success and what students felt success was in fact employability and, and being an employable graduate came up for students as a really the top the top one and secondly interesting was was kind of grading and assessment so if you look at the student voice in this, this is what they're looking for even if we feel maybe higher education has more kind of aspirational and sort of you know other kind of purposes but you know mm. the student voice are saying we need to do this and we need to do it well um, very good point and uh yeah i i, I hear you loud and clear about the uh Difficulty of assessment in our current higher education environment, given that you just mentioned employability, and I get the word itself can be contentious, but that you need to assume there's other stakeholders involved then in the process when you, you bring in the notion of employability. So can you tell us firstly what you see as the role or what's come out in your research as the role of the stakeholder in terms of employers or community agencies, firstly, and secondly, given you just mentioned student agency, perhaps the role of the student in this process ensuring authenticity? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So um, what, I, what I found, I suppose, both in the literature and it was coming out in my own findings is um, the literature and authenticity, and I suppose even your own work, Sonia, in this, which is, is you know, on the authentic framework, really talks a lot about the audience for authenticity. And, and um, so the industry partners are really, really key. And, and it also com comes out in, uh, in Rola at, at Jawi's work as well, in, in relation to that the industry partners are really, really key for authenticity. And, um, um, and, and, I suppose I know even from my own practices that my, my, my previous life was an occupational therapist. So I was actually involved a lot in working with sort of, you know, practitioners. I'm using the word practitioners, by the way, uh, to cover, kind of cover the idea of like industry partners, you know, healthcare workers, yeah. you know, the, yeah. that wider term. But they're really key in relation to because if you think that authenticity includes these stakeholders, they're really key in, in assessment. But one of the challenges is that we don't often support them enough. They don't often see that they, they themselves are employed by different systems. So, so we're expecting a lot of them. Uh, the students end up with them and working with them and learning a huge amount from them. But we need to support them. And to be clear, I suppose, in, in are they involved in assessment? You know, are they involved in feedback? Is, and, and um, you know, as I'll get through to some of the findings as well, but, but certainly we need to certainly involve them as, as partners in this um in the, in the assessment in this in this wider assessment process because they're key in relation to to ensuring that the students come out with the competencies learn like different things um from being on their placement but they're very much part of of the assessment and and even in particular the feedback process um, i suppose the other thing in relation to them as stakeholders is that if they are involved i mean they do also um you know, also get some opportunity to influence uh, the type of graduate who's coming out. Um, and so in some ways shape how they might contribute to the, to the industry in, in, in the future. So it's, it's a two-way process and they're, they're, a, they're a key partner. Yeah, key partner. And the student? 
sorry, and the student, oh yeah, the student. Um, well, the student, I would be always an advocate for the students as partners and in in empowering students. And I think, um, interesting, we have a working definition in Ireland of assessment, which, which includes assessment as learning. And the student is very much a partner in that piece. Um, and I think they have a role to um, empower, be more empowered, particularly in the work integrated learning aspect, because they go into it with such unique um, identities and skills themselves and they, they go with their own needs. So I think of really empowering students in the process is important for valid assessment, but I also think it's important for upskilling them in, in empowerment and in self-monitoring and being involved in judging how well they are doing in this. It's a really, really key skill. If we can give students the skill to self-monitor and to self-evaluate, we're really setting them up to be judges of their own skills in the workplace. So it's, I think that's one of the most powerful things to, to give students in, in this process is that they can self-evaluate and know how well they're doing themselves. So it's really, really key, I think. Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, I think there's lots of barriers to making that happen at the moment, but couldn't agree more. Yeah. So yeah. why do you think this topic Ha, um, ha, is important for and potentially impacts on the higher education sector, including those of us who, who teach, those of us who learn, and those of us who lead in the higher education institutional environment. Yeah. Well, I might start with those who lead, actually, because um, I, I think um, sometimes work integrated learning um, is seen as quite a binary in, in, in the curriculum in higher education. I think sometimes it's seen as that, you know, students do stuff on campus and then they go off on campus and it's like this just other world and, and the two, um, are, you know, don't come together. So I think even the language of work integrated learning, which really pushes the idea that this is a spectrum of, of, like, of, of, uh, of, of learning, I think is really key for policymakers. So I think from this, this idea that the, the topic and how we describe it is really important. It's seen very binary at the moment, so that there's those out there and those in here. And I think that for leaders and policymakers is really in key. Um, I think it's really important because I think, uh, certainly in Ireland, and I know internationally this is the same, that there is a real real push, you know, for graduate um, skills and, and sort of employability. Um, and I think, that, you know, so I think it's, it's important from the, the kind of national level and the sector level, the policies that, you know, um, that we look at this in the curriculum. Um, from, the, from, the, from the, I suppose, the, the teachers in, in, in this space, I do think that there are those involved in placement and those types of things, and, and they are very committed to it. But I think other, let's call them teachers, lecturers, whatever, in the curriculum really need to look at their work in relation to where they fit in with this and, and, and even <clears throat> I think your own um you know Bosco and Ferns that lovely framework that you're involved in Sonia you know really kind of had a place a really strong place in this where the, where you can look at curriculum and see where what role you have in this in relation to your modules on campus you know and, and I think it shouldn't be seen as this binary of you know there's there's the workplace and then we do this this theory practice divide I suppose so I think it's really key in that way mm. and, and I think I've mentioned the students I think again they have a, a key role in being involved in empowerment and 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 shaping how this might look for them i think mm. so they'd be the i think the key things why i thought this topic area was important excellent and uh, did you have much of a base of previous research to build on i know that the assessment is a particularly um challenging topic for many people to, to yeah. work with uh, but did you find a lot from which you can build on for your own yeah. research? Yeah, no, there were, there's, it's, it's quite a well um, written um, topic, actually, there's a lot of literature on it. Um, there's quite a bit around authentic assessment, um, because that's really popular at the moment, I think, because I think that is actually coming from a base where people are looking at traditional assessments and thinking that, you know, the, the traditional exam is not working for us. How do we make it more authentic, more engagement? So a lot of this around engagement and authenticity, um, you know, sort of, um, as I say, some of your own work, but also uh, there was a really nice um, study done by Villaro et al. And they, they looked at sort of all the literature on this and they, they actually 
actually came up with the idea that the that when they looked at all the literature, they said, well, this idea of realism is coming through, this you know, real world is coming through in a lot of the literature, um, and this cognitive challenge is coming through in the literature, and also the, the, the idea of this evaluative judgment, this idea that students you know, judge. And, and again, Rola Ajawi's work in that space, the mm. three principles of uh, authentic assessment. So authentic assessment has a lot been written about it, and not without its critiques, actually, because a lot of mm. people don't like the word authentic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I myself gave a workshop on it a few years ago, and and you know we, we we had a great discussion around you know well does that mean mine is not authentic? If you know so, the, so there's a challenge with that term, but mm -hmm. but in essence the idea of, of engagement and that um, a lot been written about work integrated learning, a lot done on mm -hmm. you know the idea of internships. Um, so that the, you know, so there's a lot of a lot of literature, um, Smith uh, Smith et al's work, you know, around kind of you know the critical issues in in work integrated learning, really bring. I think one of the th things that came to me a lot was the idea of the tension between in this space with assessment that's valid. You know, does it measure what you want it to measure, and is it reliable? And from that, I I thought, well, actually. Taking that a little step further, you know, is that well, authentic is you know, is it is it kind of genuine and real and valuable? A little bit of an extension of validity in some ways, but with a little 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 more, but also consistency. So I think that th there's been some work in this space, uh, but lots of work on assessment. It's very topical. Lots of work on feedback. Um, even the National Forum's work that I was involved in a few years ago around, you know, what is, is assessment and a lot of stuff around, you know, internships and placements and medical education that, you know, um, 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 so Govertz and, and Van der de Fluten, I think, did a lot of work around, you know, what is validity in medical education. They're, I mean, so, so a lot of different disciplines are looking at this, mm. you know, those that are, you know, the professional bodies and those involved like medicine and nursing and occupational mm. therapy and social work, a lot of, lot of work in relation to work-based yeah. assessment. They call it different things, clinical placement, mm. work-based assessment, mm. um, internships, you know, field works, mm. a lot of different language on this. Um, but a lot of literature on it. So yeah, so I had lots to build on um, and coming at it from different angles and things, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and you raised some interesting things there because when you talk about validity and reliability, et cetera, of course important, but I still think we're driven by traditional perceptions of what assessment is. And yeah. sometimes this stuff doesn't fit into all of that. That's so right. it, it's, it's very, as you say, complex. Yeah. So given that really um, detailed background, which has been very helpful, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your methodology and how you went about um, sure. gathering your data and then interpreting that data? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose there are three um, main methodological um, methods, I suppose. Um, but I suppose the overarching approach I wanted to do was more participatory action research. Uh, and it was an approach that I had done myself a few years ago. And in essence, just I suppose to explain it a little bit, it's that you work with you work with people in general to help them make changes to their own practice. So it's, it's really trying to suppose, again, it goes with my, my philosophy of empowerment of students and empowerment. It really tries to empower. <clears throat> so a, a centerpiece, I suppose, in, in my work was working with disciplinary groups. And I, I picked nine disciplinary groups um, who had a student, a practitioner and an educator in, in all the groups in, in, in the workshops, there were three hour workshops, working with them to develop solutions to their own practice. Um, so the methodology actually, I, I'm quite proud of the methodology mm. because it really actually worked with them to come up with solutions to their practice. So, so that, that mm. was the key kind of center part. But before I did that, I actually um, looked at, I, I was lucky to have access to, the national student survey data, which is a, a survey a little bit like the, I think the Nessie in, in Australia, which, which is a mm. student engagement survey. Um, mm -hmm. And it actually is a survey that asks students around their engagement. So I had actually access to the five years of that data. So I was able to look at the question, what could institutions do to improve, which again is around solutions, asking the student voice, it's kind of fit in with the, the philosophy. And so I, I, I you know, 95,000 comments on that, that I was able to, to access. So, um, so that I was able to look at that and, um, and then do my workshops, which came up with some solutions. And also I was able to, I had the, 
was able to talk to seven researchers um, before I did the workshops around their understanding of work integrated learning assessment. And that was really very valuable to get kind of expertise. So I had a nice mixture of the student mm. voice from these surveys, mm. seven mm. researchers who gave me great in insight into what they were doing in the literature and what they thought. And then these, you know, three, sorry, then these um, nine workshops um, which was around developing solutions to their discipline. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to finish at the end of the year, coming back to the seven researchers, just to sort of present it back to them and see how it could actually impact on, on practice. So, so given the, the range of um, participants and the different yeah. backgrounds, which I think is intriguing, I've got two questions, sorry, two questions in one again. Yeah. The first is, were there any themes that resonated across all stakeholders, that is themes they shared, and were there anything that was particularly uh, um, something that came from you know, a particular stakeholder and not necessarily another? Yeah, yes. Um, Across them all, I suppose, they, they all, I suppose it was really particularly looking at the consistency and authenticity and things that came with it. Certainly what came across them all um, was it's really important to have clear expectations. You know, this this came through a lot. You know, we need to be clear, you know, transparency needs to be really clear. And in some, some ways that, that falls in the middle between consistency and authenticity. If it's not clear, yes. you know, like it won't be valid and it won't be authentic yes. and it won't be so. So that came through a lot with everybody. Um, the, the, the idea we should be talking about this and this interstakeholder dialogue came through a lot between across um, across them all, you know, uh, that it's, you know, we need to talk about it, we need to, it's not something that's solved easily, and we need to make sure that we all get our voice heard, and um, so that was, it came through. Um, in relation to authenticity, the students, interestingly, the student voice in the um, large-scale data, the survey data, nearly a third of the comments of all the open comments were related to work and authenticity and real, particularly around the realism side. So the mm. students are really pushing, you know, this idea, it needs to be practical, real, you know, um, yes. and interestingly, the researchers also really felt strongly about that. You know, it's, it's mm. really important, it's authentic. It's, in fact, you know, it's the more, <clears throat> much more important. Consistency is great, we need to be able to stand over, but you know something, if it's not real and if it's not kind of empowering and if it's not, you know, it's, that's really important. Um, but there was maybe a little bit more of a mix with the consistency piece in the workshops because the consistency um, in the workshops came through a stronger uh, than authenticity, mm. which which was interesting. Mm. So mm. so there was a couple of common things. The the interstakeholder dialogue expectations were certainly common, but when you start delving down into the weighting of authenticity and consistency, it was a little bit different among different stakeholders. Mm. And 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 what I suppose that was your second question, actually, wasn't it? The difference? Yeah. Yeah. And in relate to delve into that a little bit more. So yeah. I'm wondering. When, well, let's think about our university staff, our teaching staff, who in the main are a yeah. really hardworking, passionate group of people. And, and I think they believe in this. But what, what have, did they cite as key challenges for them in actually achieving ultimately an authentic framework for their, their assessment? Yes, they, interestingly, they struggled particularly with authenticity when it came to work integrative learning and, and when I say that more so than the practitioners and the students they they struggled with authenticity when it came to things like you know writing a report uh, back in the institution having done a placement you know that they found they really struggled the, the, the educators and the students a little bit also in that space so there was a particular challenge with, with, interestingly, there was less challenge with authenticity and stuff where people were doing things like problem-based learning on campus and project work. Everybody was delighted, even though it was on campus with authenticity, where there was a little more of a challenge um, for educators and, and students a little bit too, is the type of placement where they go off and they have an experience, the practitioners are not involved, and they come back and they write a report or they write a reflection, like post, post placement and that's when there was a particular challenge with authenticity actually mm. that type mm. of context so 
when you were on campus and you, you knew you were on campus and it was better than the exams, it was like, this is great because they're doing like stuff. But the report, even though if they had been on a placement and came back, that was when the most interesting, when educators were most challenged by the, the idea of authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, more so sometimes, as I say, than the on-campus one, <laughs> that they weren't mm -hmm. out of placement. So, so mm -hmm. interestingly, and you might be particularly interested in this, Sonia, because the, the, this idea that authenticity is a continuum from placement, so from, from campus to placement, isn't necessarily a very linear direct line, you know, no. uh, you know, and actually, um, and in fact, it was interesting when I talked, I know you were asking about the educators particularly, but talking to one of the researchers and um, they were involved in quite um, really elaborate authentic projects on campus and they said they had actually really great success with them and they struggle sometimes with placements where the practitioner wasn't involved and the students came back and as I say did a presentation or did a report or wrote it up afterwards and they felt that actually it didn't feel that authentic so I think I'm not sure if quite answering your question but that was where the, mm. that was the most challenge with authenticity from the mm. educators was that kind of context mm. um, does that mm. make sense Yes, it does. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So were there any other, you've, I think you've highlighted some of the findings. Um, yeah. Is there any other findings that you, the initial findings that have come out that you haven't, that you would like to tell us about today? Well, yeah, I mentioned that um, authenticity was a challenge in the, um, that type of placement with, where you know, where they, they weren't assessed in placement and they came back. Um, interesting Although, I think one of the interesting findings is that although the student voice with that national survey came up as realism and authenticity being really important, when it came to sort of placement types, and this is from a lot of the workshops, the student's biggest challenge was consistency when they were out in placement. And I thought I was surprised um, that actually this, and in fact, consistency came up in the workshops as bigger challenges than authenticity. They were Can I just ask consistency in what so consistency in how the students were assessed so things like you know they and this linked a little bit some of the findings with how they were graded um consistency and for example when they might go to one particular placement and if they were graded a b c d or percentages but often a b c d that if they go to such and such a placement you know they give all a's whereas if they go to another type of placement you know they 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 they, they don't do A's, they only give C's and D's. So this type of inconsistency in context. And then within the sort of placement, and these are probably more in placement, some of these examples, that within the, the placement context that, you know, uh, you know, Mary was would mark easily, and you know, if they had Peter as a kind of a, a kind of a therapist or a, as a kind of a co-worker, you know, that they, they marked, you know, harder. And so this kind of um, inconsistency, and that was often linked, I found in the findings, and this came up quite a lot in the idea of the grading scales. So if they used like a more mm. pass fail or competent, not yet competent, they actually, there was less challenge, challenge with consistency. They were allowed to kind of just relax a little bit. So, so that, so that's why consistency was coming up, I think, in a lot of placements. Mm. And that did lead to one of the, um, some of the findings in relation to competencies. This came through a lot again in, in the workshops and, and in the interviews that in writing competencies, you know, for a placement. So this is like, say, for example, the form that they use when they go out in placements. If this is a long list of competencies, there was a huge challenge with consistency because people, sometimes people didn't even have an opportunity to see things on the list that came up, you know, mm -hmm. I was, there was a very interesting, very interesting comment from one of, one of the um, uh, therapists actually in one of the, one of the disciplinary groups. And they said, we were making up scenarios so we could actually tick a box, you know, um, so, so this came through as, as a challenge. So one of the kind of findings, I'm, I'm, uh, one of the key findings is this, is that there's manageable sets of competencies um, mm -hmm. and that they're not this kind of like, you know, 95 competencies, that there's some sort of a man manageable yeah. set of competencies. And linked mm -hmm. with that, I think another thing that came through is if you had this manageable set of competencies and then you could empower students to self-regulate and, and work with partners in, in industry 
then you can actually take those broader competencies but bring them uniquely to the context and i think again this has come up in the literature before but this was coming through um as, as in a lot of solutions so yeah um, so when this that to me brings us back to our traditional notion and model of assessment and it actually doesn't work. Yeah. So, Jordan, it's intriguing. And as you know, um, one day let's hope we work together because uh, I can see that we're very, think very much alike um, and have done similar sorts of research. But to finish off, what do you think your findings have? What impact potentially have they got for higher education policy and practice locally within Ireland and perhaps even globally? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think the first thing that I would say is that we have to recognise in our policies and practices that employability things are very important to students. So I think, you know, we, we, you know, so our, our, we do need to to make sure that our policies support the, the development of the, these skills. Uh, another thing I think that matters, and I think this may be, it, it is in an Irish context, and I, I think in some ways, Australia and Canada and some internationals are, are ahead of us in this way, but I think the language matters. And what I mean by that is I think we need to start using terms like work integrated learning, which I know have been used a lot in Australia and Canada, but, but not probably everywhere. And I think this it's really important that we start using this in our policies or uh, and the reason I think that is that there's it, again, it takes away from this binary in policies of, well, we've got placement offices over here, we've got the educator staff here, we've the students here, and we've industry here, and they, they don't mix or they don't meet. So I think in, in the language, it's important that work integrated learning suggests a more integrated curriculum and staff and people and, and that dialogue. Um, and equally, I think assessment, language matters when it comes to the word assessment. When we talk assessment, we need to also understand, as in the Irish definition of assessment, that this includes the graded piece, the feedback piece, and the self-monitoring piece, the self-evaluation. That when we talk assessment, we're talking that all for and as learning, and I think that matters. Uh, the other thing I think that, that is really important in policy is we need to build an interstakeholder dialogue into our practice and policies in, in, so that we have opportunities to meet. We need to build in forums that, um, that get these people together in the room. Um, you know, and, and, and we, in, in looking at that, we need to look at how, how we actually progress that kind of dialogue. I need, we need to empower students in the work integrated learning processes. Um, you know, I know students as partners is coming into a lot of institutional policies, but we need to look at make sure it's coming into the, the work integrated learning pieces. Competencies need to be manageable. I think this has uh, um, implications for professional bodies and across the world. You know, when they're really looking at their accreditation piece, when we're looking at quality assurance processes, we don't need a long, long list of competencies. I think we need to look at how we get the, the right amount of policies and the right, the right pitch for our competencies. I think institutional grading schemes need to be seriously looked at in relation to um, how we grade in this space and how we actually, um, many of them talked about, um, well, we only, we, we're using the grading scales because it's in our practices, our institutional policies and, and therefore, but we really would prefer to use, you know, like pass, fail or competent, not your competence. So with the institutional grading schemes, really seriously need to be, to be looked at and how we value different types of evidence and transcripts with different types of evidence. I think this is, this would be a really transformative change. And I think that many in, in, internationally would probably feel the same in that space. And I think that my last point of this is practitioners, if they're involved in assessment, which we, we do want for them to be authentic to the practitioners are involved, um, but they need support in this space. They need to be resourced. They need to, to professional development in this space. We can't just land them into this and expect them to do this consistently and be authentic, be involved authentically. So I, I think resourcing uh, and, and, and professional development for this broader group of, of practitioners is, is really, really key. Otherwise, we can't have consistency and authenticity, I think, is, is where these would fall down. So they'd be my key suggestions for kind of policy and practice. 
Well, Joanne, it sounds like a very interesting and certainly important part of research in higher education, and it's definitely of global interest. So we wish you luck in, in bringing this to fruition, and we look forward to seeing how um, it all comes out in the end and reading the final report. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for your time as well. It's great talking to you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.